Welcome, everybody. It's a, truly a great honor and pleasure for me to host this event here today at the Social Data Science Center at the University of Maryland. We um, have been planning this particular um, speaker series for a long time and have been looking forward to uh, talking about the issue of large scale infrastructure for social data science um, with our invited guests, but also with the panel members. Um, I do know that uh, around the National Science Foundation, around uh, statistical agencies, not just in the US, but around the world, uh, this topic comes up a lot. We all know that we are in a context where traditional social science data collection is challenged by costs and other things. There's great um, interest in opening up data sources and um, we are fortunate to have here a collection of different perspectives, both from the US and from Europe, from academia and government um, to shed some light on this topic. So um, the, just a few words at the beginning. Um, we will have, well, we ask each of the speakers to talk for about 10 minutes and present their ideas or projects they work on. And um, we, if you have questions while they talk, please use the Q&A feature, which is in the middle of the screen down there. Um, and I enter your question there. I will monitor those questions and we will make sure that in uh, the half hour discussion that we have, um, we'll address those questions and uh, other topics that come up while the uh, speakers um, talk. So I look very much forward to uh, um, our three uh, input talks here and then talking to all of you. We're gonna start with Nancy Potok. Um, in the DC area, there's hardly anyone who <laughs> has known her, but since we have a very international audience, I do want to mention that uh, currently she's the CEO of NEPIX Consulting, but she formerly was the chief statistician of the United States and has um, co-chaired the federal data strategy, part of that role. And uh, prior to that, she was deputy director at the US Census Bureau. and numerous other positions that I'm not going to list here all, but you can tell that uh, she has a sort of deep insight into the government perspectives, but she also worked in the private sector. So she really uh, covers nicely um, academia, private sector, and um, the federal government. Currently, uh, she's still on the task force for uh, census quality indicators, and that will be also uh, reflected in some of her notes today. So Nancy, thank you very much for taking the time to uh, contribute to this panel today. And uh, we have a large audience and we're all interested in hearing what you have to say. Thanks very much. Um, I'm delighted to be here and talking about one of my favorite topics. So let me uh, share my screen. And uh, let's get it up there. Okay. Um, so I, I would like to start by talking um, a little bit about um, the context in which all this is taken, taking place and our data ecosystem. So we have legislation, um, the Foundations for Evidence-Based Policymaking Act. We have a federal data strategy and we have a myriad of other legislation regulations that exist. And I would say the first two are very helpful. Um, and it's a mixed bag on the other pieces of legislation and regulations. And I'll, I'll delve into that a little bit um, later. And we have these, what I call topical islands of expertise. So we have a number of clusters of subject matter experts, um, researchers, uh, government agencies, um, and, and the public who is affected by these things uh, around topics, health, criminal justice, economic opportunity. Um, and I would say, particularly in the health area, um, the pandemic has really um, heightened awareness among people who were rather indifferent to the importance of linking data and having an infrastructure to do that until at least in the US, they realized that um, the health data was in terrible shape when it came to really 
sharing among all the different parties that were important for providing information from the you know, local governments to the hospital systems, states and federal. Um, and, and it was not possible to get a really good national picture of what was going on. And I think that woke a lot of people up. So there's some great opportunity now. Um, we have, of course, all these levels of government that are very interested. Um, we have academia, and um, that includes people who are researchers in the topical areas, but also people in data science and computer science um, in other technology fields who are interested in advancing the ability to link data um, generally. And then, of course, we have the private sector. There's a lot of technology and data companies either collecting and selling their own data or um, doing it on behalf of the agencies or creating some of the technology that's used for this. Um, we have foundations and nonprofits who are very key players in this ecosystem. Um, foundations in particular have provided incredible funding to advance pilot projects and look at various ideas and create roadmaps for how to advance in this area, which has been crucial in the absence of government funding for that. Um, and then of course we have the, the data, um, data sets and all kinds of data out there, which none of this would exist without. Um, so just um, very quickly, I, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, the federal data strategy really um, was put together as a framework for advancing work across government agencies um, to improve the use of data and to make it more accessible. So it's wrapped in um, enterprise data governance, but it really focuses on commercialization, innovation, and use for the public, putting open data out there that the federal government has. Um, Decision-making and accountability, which is creating evidence to drive good policies and improve programmatic outcomes. Um, and then access use and augmentation, which is really how do you make the data, specially protected data more accessible? How do you look at interoperability? Um, and what does the infrastructure look like? And um, those, those are key elements. And so every year the federal data strategy has ac an action plan. The pandemic really slowed down the 2020 action plan as you might imagine. Um, but these are some of the key things, putting together um, an ethics framework, developing a data protection toolkit for um, making sure that privacy and confidentiality are adequately protected. Um, measuring data quality, um, having inventories, looking at um, the proper role for uh, artificial intelligence and modeling in the operations of agencies, et cetera. So these are very key things for um, the federal agencies to really move ahead on. And they are moving ahead, um, but they're, as I say, 2020 really uh, got slowed down quite a bit and the 2021 plan is not out yet. Um, very quickly, the Evidence Act was also a game changer here. It had three titles. Um, the first one um, really created an environment where agencies were pushed to do more outcome evaluation type work um, and really um, put an emphasis, I think, on some of the social sciences. And then um, the Open Data Act really involved um, setting up chief data officers, um, pushing open data out there, interoperability, um, and really improving the management of data. And then the third title really had to do with improving access to protected data, um, mostly what we would call for statistical activities, but that statistical activities can really involves taking sensitive data and linking it um, it was trying to push ahead an infrastructure, but um, the, the act really was um, putting in place 11 recommendations of the Evidence-Based Policymaking Commission. I was one of the commissioners, and um, one of the things I would have liked to have seen in the legislation that wasn't there was setting up the National 
infrastructure for data linkages, but instead the act um, set up an advisory committee that was to look at this for two years. Um, so it slowed things down a bit, I think. Um, and, you know, perhaps if, a, if that infrastructure had been in place before the pandemic, we wouldn't be in quite where we are in terms of the state of the health data, because there would have been a place available and open to go to that was kind of a one-stop shop for trying to um, link these various data instead of having it in a lot of different islands. Um, one thing that I particularly want to mention is the um, Confidential Information Protection and Statistical Efficiency Act, originally passed in 2002, updated in the Evidence Act. This is really critical to put the building blocks in place for a national infrastructure, um, because what it does is it takes the federal statistical agencies, and I think uh, most of you probably know we have a very decentralized system in the US. We don't have an office of national statistics or a centralized office. We have 13 different agencies. And um, this provides a kind of a uniform approach to sharing data among the statistical agencies. And it gives them a mandate that some national statistical offices in some countries already have, um, but in the US, wasn't there, um, which is that if the statistical agency needs data from another agency in order to do its statistical work, it's mandatory for the agency to give that to the statistical agency to link and do statistical activities um, unless there's a law that specifically prohibits sharing that particular data set or that type of data from the agency, which was a massive step forward, but we're still missing the infrastructure. So um, one of the things that I did when I left government was start to really focus on how do we modernize the data infrastructure? What should we be doing? And um, I wrote a paper, co-wrote it with um, Nick Hart, who is the president of the Data Foundation. And um, we looked at various design considerations for how to um, set up a national infrastructure. And we built on the work, both of the Evidence Commission and also um, the National Academies of Science, which had um, set up a special panel that looked at these issues. Um, one of the key pieces of this was um, recognizing that our historical approach in the US to addressing data needs is really ineffective and that um, the infrastructure that we have is very fragmented. So we have capacity in different places, um, but it is, it is not um, really organized in a good way. So we wanted to, um, overcome objections to prior proposals where people did not want to see a data warehouse. Um, and we wanted enhanced privacy protections. We came up with these attributes. Um, and I, we can talk about these more in the Q and A's. I know I'm kind of out of time here. Um, but a recommendation for how to take care of these attributes was to establish something that I think is, um, a unique structure of the US. So if we have people who are not familiar with this, a federally funded research and development center um, is really a contractor who has special capabilities to partner with parts of the federal government in a nonprofit way to really develop this. And we felt that was the right structure. We recommended the National Science Foundation after looking at multiple places in government where this could be housed. And we definitely wanted it in government, but done through a contractor to provide more agility and ability to keep up with technological changes. Um, so we went, we actually were pretty well received on these recommendations. I think um, it's being looked at quite seriously at the National Science Foundation. And um, what I think has to happen now, if this is going to really occur and move from concept to reality, 
is to address these issues. And, and we recommended that the advisory committee that was set up by the Evidence Act look at this, but it's moving very slowly. So I think we have to step out and look at these issues of sustainability. How is this gonna be funded? Um, what are the right approaches to privacy and confidentiality protection that balance the risk of revealing things versus the utility of having highly accurate data? What kind of governance and oversight structure is needed? Um, putting in place an ethical framework. What functionalities should it have? How does it scale up? Um, is it a one-stop shop? Can it be kind of a, a place where other um, types of data linking um, services can use a standard um, that's set maybe at a national center so that interoperability and sharing data becomes a much more standardized type of thing, even if it's not all located through the same facility. Um, how, how is that center going to keep up with technological advancement? And I think really important and, um, you know, I think this became very obvious with everything that happened with our decennial census of population this year, the 2020 census, transparency and, and really being able to see that this is independent, that there's scientific integrity, that privacy is being protected and it's not, nothing that's happening there is being politically influenced. Um, so I will just skip through these really quickly. Um, you know, there's state interests, and when I say state, I also mean local and tribal. Um, there's academic interests in, in having this. And um, of course the foundations and the nonprofits, especially from the social science and public policy research aspects, um, funding pilot projects and looking at better outcomes for society. So I will stop there. That's great. And I can attest to everybody that the document cover that you saw there um, is a document worth reading. I mean, the, the, you know, setting up infrastructure is not usually my bedtime um, reading, but this one actually was fun to go through. And I can highly recommend, uh, in particular, the way they sort of discussed various alternatives. Nancy just pointed out the final recommendations, but the the, the in your country, for those of you that listen from other places than the US, uh, it might be interesting just to see sort of the argument back and forth on in which setting what thing might work. So I highly recommend that. I'm glad, Nancy, you brought up um, the benefits for uh, researchers and uh, nonprofits or maybe even industry. That's something I would like to come back to when we discuss in the panel. But uh, let's continue with Daniel Oberski. Um, and uh, Daniel, while you get set up with video and slides, I um, will introduce you here briefly to the audience. Daniel is uh, also talking about a big endeavor similar to the things that Nancy pointed out should be put in place and is in the process of putting them into place in the Netherlands but coming through academia as a driving force as opposed to government, the perspective that we just heard. Um, Daniel is an associate professor for data science methodology at the Utrecht University and uh, has uh, been at various other uh, universities in the Netherlands before. Uh, he collaborates heavily with um, the medical school, also in Utrecht, and uh, has taught uh, an associate professorship for data science methodologies um, in, in good company here with multiple affiliation and interests. He also uh, spent some time with us uh, last year in Berkeley at the um, Simon's uh, semester on privacy. So I know that's big on your mind and we are interested to hear, Daniel, how all of this comes together in what's also called soda over there in the Netherlands. Thank you for coming. Yeah, thanks so much, Frauke, for that uh, great introduction. So um, I'd like to tell you uh, something about what we're doing over here in the Netherlands um, in terms of social data science. And specifically, um, I'd like to talk about um, this project called Odyssey, which is, um, I'll explain what it is in a bit. Um, but, but first, um, I would like to uh, clear up uh, one, one thing that I've experienced I need to clear up in these talks, and that's the actual location of the Netherlands, uh, also called Holland, and uh, the fact that we call our language, or you call our language Dutch. I didn't come up with that, the Anglo-Saxons did, so don't, don't look at me for the confusing 
And um, specifically, we are not Denmark. That's, that's a different country. All right, so having cleared that up, Odyssey is the Dutch uh, national research infrastructure for the social sciences. So it's funded by the National Science Foundation of the Netherlands and all faculties of social science in the Netherlands. And um, it, it, you could say it sort of consists of three major parts uh, of which I'll discuss mostly uh, the first two. And uh, the first one is um, data collection uh, for, uh, for social sciences and metadata access. Um, and uh, second is data analysis and innovation services. And the social data science team that I'm um, coordinating is a part of that, that second bit. And then uh, we're all, we also have, the Odyssey also has a network and community function uh, for computational social science, but I won't discuss that much today. So um, in terms of the um, major topic for today, data and metadata access, um, there's sort of three main data sources that I'm identifying here, and I'm, I'm oversimplifying the project um, that are integrated within Odyssey. Those are the um, large longitudinal probability surveys that we do over here. Um, perhaps you've heard of LIS, European Social Survey, the Survey of Health, Aging and Retirement, European Value Studies, Gender and Generations Projects. Many of those are also international uh, European projects. Then the uh, Netherlands Twin Register that consists of about um, 60,000 pairs of twins uh, and their families, uh, complete genetic information, biomaterial, and then uh, the sort of main menu item from these things, uh, which is the administrative register data from Statistics Netherlands. We've already heard from Nancy that um, there are some differences internationally in um, statistical systems. In the Netherlands, Statistics uh, Netherlands is the agency that's uh, legally entitled to receive data from every level of government um, and also has infrastructure in place to do so. Um, and in fact has done so since 1974. So what kind of data is available in the upper data from Statistics Netherlands for research? It's uh, all of these types of things. You can find more information under that link. Um, unfortunately, most of it is in Dutch, uh, so you, um, which is understandable given the fact that uh, you probably need a collaboration with uh, Dutch researchers to access these, such data anyway. Talking about things like um, education data, uh, labor, statistics data, uh, income, energy. So data about persons, but also data about uh, companies and households. Uh, all of this data, so the, the service uh, register um, and the administrative register data that can be linked to the different people uh, in those data collections are um, can be analyzed within uh, the Dutch supercomputing facility, Cartesius. Um, it's always hard to find a good visualization of a supercomputer because it's just a bunch of boxes in a room. But I thought it would be nice to show you this picture, especially the one on the lower right, uh, because it's just, a, even though it's just a picture of a building, this building is actually right next to my house. So I, I often uh, run, go running past this picture. Uh, so you can analyze such data within the supercomputer facility. And here are some examples of uh, already completed pilot product projects um, in the time when we were still setting up Odyssey. Um, uh, like already, I already mentioned the Netherlands Twin Register. One thing that people that make use of the um, genome-wide association data to study associations with uh, inequalities of uh, health, healthcare costs. Um, another interesting project was the integration of geospatial data with uh, social surveys uh, that's on the right. And um, for me, the most exciting and the most interesting uh, project that we've done so far is the so what they call the social network of the Netherlands. Um, you can imagine that using the administrative register data um, available to Statistics Netherlands, you can see which to other people by uh, virtue of being in the same classroom by being, uh, having the same employer, by being family members and so forth. And in fact, uh, Statistics Netherlands can do that for all residents of the Netherlands, um, including some of the people who are watching uh, I saw right now. Um, and so this is an incredibly rich data set of uh, uh, social networks. As far as I know, it's the largest social, real social network uh, data sets uh, there is. 
And of course, you can link your own uh, social science, social scientific data connection to that as well in the secure computing facility. That's very exciting stuff. So that's about data and uh, data, uh, metadata access. Uh, there's a lot more to say about that, but I'm giving the highly simplified version. Uh, the part that, that I'm uh, coordinating is uh, called the social data science team, which is part of the sort of data analysis and innovation services. And uh, we just got started just like the, the rest of Odyssey in 2020. But here's some examples of things that we've been doing um, so far. We're uh, making, uh, at the top right, you see this automated systematic reviewing, which is that we're making um, a program that we made to help people do systematic literature reviews using machine learning available for social scientists. You can read all about that in, we recently published a paper in um, Nature Machine Intelligence about this uh, that you can read about in the um, uh, DOI. Um, another interesting project that we're doing is um, uh, called Bias Corrected Crowdsourcing Project to use on OSM Enriched. It's about uh, pulling in location and geographic geospatial information data uh, from OpenStreetMaps and other uh, data, online data sources into, uh, for example, social surveys, but could also be in, uh, in this case application to crowdsourcing projects. So that's where uh, usually natural scientists uh, use people to collect data. In this case, it was data collection project on plastics in uh, Leiden, which is one of the cities we have over here. And um, uh, people were counting where, where the plastic is, but you can imagine that if you use people to collect data uh, for even if it's, even though it's uh, natural objective science, those people, nasty people are bringing in their uh, selectivity and measurement errors as usual. And so we need the same kind of uh, correction methods, bias correction methods that we need for regular social surveys. For example, people count only uh, in places where they happen to be. And so if you use a type, certain type of certified type of person, you get a certain type of result from a crowdsourcing project. And so uh, we made this R package OSM enriched to uh, to do that. Another project that we're doing together with uh, Rasmus in, the, uh, in Rotterdam is the Dutch version of a, an American project, the Opportunity Atlas, uh, where we're using uh, administrative register data again to show uh, the differential in opportunity across uh, different social classes. So um, we're, our main uh, purpose is to uh, provide services for the um, Dutch members of Odyssey, but we're also very interested to uh, collaborate uh, internationally. And so you asterisk means that um, uh, if you like to make use of the facilities of Odyssey uh, at the moment, that's only possible through collaboration with uh, researchers who are a member of Odyssey. But fortunately, uh, most social scientists in the Netherlands are a member of Odyssey. So um, I'm sure you'll have no trouble finding us. And uh, if you need more information, I'm very happy to talk to any and all of you. Uh, and you can find some, uh, my contact information uh, down there and my Twitter handle and other things. So that's it. Thank you. Thanks, Daniel. Fascinating. Uh, this is what we have hope to have in place elsewhere and here it is i will i can already tell you now ask you later on who is doing all the hard work and the linkage and how big is your team because some of us are wondering what to put into place when we apply for example to nsf to make something like this happen so um looking forward to uh, have that discussion and see how feasible is this outside the netherlands uh, without as strong of a statistical system as you have um in the meantime i um before we get to that panel, I'm um, very glad that I can introduce our last uh, set of speakers. <laughs> um, uh, Laura Stapleton um, is kind enough to share her perspective, uh, or UMD perspective, I guess, um, together with Tracy Sweet on the Maryland Longitudinal Data System and Data Integration Project. Um, Laura Stapleton is uh, Associate Dean and Professor uh, here at the University of Maryland. Um, she has this exciting type, uh, a title, Associate Dean for Research, Innovation and Partnership. And um, she's also, that's the connection I know her through uh, Professor in Measurement Statistics and Evaluation um, at the University of Maryland, uh, a, a program that's 
very dear to my heart because um, the, the joint program and server methodology and you know them have been swapping courses back and forth uh, for for many decades now. Um, and she's joined by Tracy uh, Sweet from the uh, Department of Human Development and Quantitative Methodology, also an associate professor here at the um, University of Maryland. And uh, she does actually, uh, I think Daniel will at next uh, apply for working with you on the Odyssey project because she works on um, uh, social network models and multi-level models and uh, with application to education data. So very much uh, in the focus of what I know is of interest to you and the infrastructure you build. So, uh, without further ado, I'll turn the mic over to both of you, and then uh, we'll hop all together in the discussion. Thank you, Fraga. And I apologize if the screen is going in and out. I'm having issues with my uh, presentation. Um, but um, so I am the former associate director for research for the Maryland Longitudinal Data Systems Center, and Tracy Sweet is the current uh, associate director for research. Uh, and we're teaming up here to provide a bit of a case study of the things that Nancy was talking about in, in developing uh, linked data across systems. And please tell me if the slide changes. Has it changed? Yes, it has. Thank you. All right, so today I'm gonna to share with you the history of this case study, this Maryland Longitudinal Data System, and get, just get wet your appetite about the data that are housed in here, and just a mention about how those data were linked. And then we'll end with a couple of current projects um, on synthesizing the data and um, applied projects for policy. So um, the Maryland State Department of Education had reserved, received federal grants. So many states around the country, the US, uh, received grants to set up state longitudinal data systems. And this usually involved um, the K through 12, the, the elementary and secondary education data. In 2010, our former governor, uh, Martin O'Malley, um, was, was really keen on um, combining data across the educational system. And so the state of Maryland passed this law 10 years ago to create a separate unit of state government that it contained both the elementary and secondary data, the post-secondary data from the Maryland Higher Education Commission and earnings information from the Department of Labor Licensing and Regulation. So three different state agencies. And so, Two years later, they submitted this request for proposals to house the center. And so several different places um, submitted proposals and the University of Maryland College Park campus and the Baltimore campus submitted a joint proposal. And as Nancy brought up, um, you know, who, who runs this sort of integrated um, data system is a big question. And the three agencies that were required to provide the data also submitted a proposal. And the governor's office was interested in combining those two so that we have research, academic researchers as well as the agencies that know the data best combine efforts. So in fact, we did combine efforts and the MLDS Center opened in 2013. And really it took probably more than two years to get data in such a good condition that they were reusable. Um, this was the original uh, organizational chart, really, of the MLDS Center, and it's, it's similar to where it stands now, but, but there have been um, uh, improvements. So there's a governing board made up of a variety of stakeholders around, around the state, including uh, parents, teachers, uh, the heads of the agencies that provide the data. Um, there's an executive director, Ross Goldstein, who has been in that position uh, for many years, doing a wonderful job. We've got the faculty um, run the research branch of the, of the center, and these are all from the University System of Maryland schools. And each of the agencies that provide data have a half-time person who is a liaison and works in the center, as well as stays in the agency that they uh, are from. And then we have a large information technology team that does all of the other hard work. Um, and just to give you an idea of what type of data are in, are in the system or intended to be in the system, in the blue section is we have kind of the elementary and secondary data. So it, for every year, for every school a student attends, there's attendance information about if they were there, how, you know, how many days are absent. There's whether they were retained in grade or if they were promoted. Um, there's uh, status of whether perhaps they re receive free and reduced meals, English language learner, or in special education. Once you get into the upper grades, there are assessment scores. And then there's information about achievements, whether they graduated or earned a certificate. At the post-secondary level, there's what institution they're, they're attending, and maybe they're attending many. There's um, whether they 
what there's intended to be courses and grades, but those haven't been integrated into the system yet. Information about financial aid. And then the end, whether they've graduated and what programs they've graduated in. And then at the workforce, the yellow area, we have information about the organization where the person is employed, the earnings that they receive uh, for each quarter, and the sector of their organization. Note that there's not information about what type of job they have or the hours they spend in that job. The data were uh, started 2007, 2008. And so there's about 10 years of data in there. There will be a, a 20 years of data for an individual uh, going forward. And so for these three data sources, information that are, you know, PII data, our uh, race, gender, citizenship, um, the SACID, that's the elementary secondary ID value, social security number, first name, last name, if it's there, and birth date are used for matching. And the matching was highly successful, but not perfect. And so for some, some folks didn't have SSNs or we weren't sure the SSN was correct. So we got, there's approval to bounce the uh, data against the Mo Motor Vehicles uh, Administration just for SSN verification. Once those data are linked, that information is removed, it's out behind a firewall and there's a new ID in the system. So there's a great Venn diagram that's on the, the website showing you what, how much data are in the system and where the overlap is. And this center is really focused on these overlapping areas. It is not designed to answer questions about the labor force per se or enroll or in earnings per se. In fact, the only labor records that should be in there are those that match to either the post-secondary data or elementary uh, secondary data. All right, so accessing the data. So by law, you had to be staff to uh, access the data. Over time, the board has developed a policy, however, to have temporary staff appointments if a research plan is approved, and there's an ex explanation of how that happens. Um, but in order to allow more people to at least use these data in some way, we receive funding for what's called the Synthetic Data Project. And so the US Department of Education in 2015 provided us uh, funds to see if we could synthesize the data. And we looked at full synthesization. And this was joint work of a variety of players. And we had three overarching goals. One is to create a gold standard file that is a bit like a data, a data warehouse um, of variables that have been well vetted uh, and then creating synthetic re replicates of those and examine whether we can in some way contain or in include cluster specific variants because education data naturally are nested within organizations and, and the employment data are within, uh, are within organizations. So the goal of that project was that. And if you're interested in that, I'll talk, I can talk later about that, but we don't have time to go into detail on that. And I'm gonna turn it over now to Tracy who will explain a little bit about current projects. Great. So. Um... Here's just a, a short sample of the most recent um, external research projects. Um, and these are all found on the MLCS Center website. Um, so things, uh, for example, looking at the effect of high school career technology education, um, looking at the effects of a need-based need uh, grant aid um, for college students, looking at how concentrated um, poverty in terms of schools and students impact outcomes. And of course, there's a health career, a specific health career technology technical education program. Um, the thing that I want to focus on, and then we'll go into a couple of these in detail, is um, on this cross-sector research. So all of these um, studies really look at the effects of um, you know, college graduation, college attain att attainment or college enrollment, um, as well as workforce outcomes. Okay, sorry, Laura, next slide. Okay, um, so for example, the high school career and technology education um, study looked at high school graduates during uh, two academic years and basically studied whether or not they were more or less likely to enroll in two or four year colleges than, than graduates um, that were similar. And so what they found is that students, um, these graduates that participated in these career technology education programs were more likely to enroll in two-year colleges, but less likely to enroll in four-year colleges. Um, and similarly, they found that they had higher average wages in terms of earning six years post high school graduation. Um, the next one, um, and then we'll just, we won't go into all of them. Um, we'll just go into this, we'll talk about this one. 
So this is a, a study on need-based grant aid. And so the, um, Maryland has um, uh, an educational assistant grant called the Howard P. Rawlings um, EA grant. And this is for students who are in financial need um, and they need to be bachelor's degree seeking students. And the, the grant is for $3,000 and it can be renewed annually. Um, and so the, the um, object of this study was to look at what is the effect of receiving this aid? Um, so if I were to look at uh, students that received the aids compared to students who didn't receive um, this grant, what we, find, what we found is that these grant recipients were more likely to persist through the, the fourth year of, um, of college. They're more likely to have graduated within five years. Um, and then they also had higher wages post-college um, post graduation. Um, we don't really have time to go into um, the other slides, so I'm going to skip those. But I do think um, I did want to mention a couple things uh, really quickly before we close out. Um, one that is um, the center is um, moving toward looking at potential for um, potential for looking at cross state um, linkage or looking at students that leave the state, um, looking at people across states, and that would be um, that's something that hasn't happened yet that I think might be in the future, um, as well as looking at linking people across additional sectors. So right now we have um, K-12 higher ed and labor and licensing, but there are obviously there are other um, agencies in the state of Maryland that have data. And so looking into avenues of, of even broadening kind of the work that the center is doing. Um, but I'm gonna stop there and um, thank you Great. everyone. Thank you, Tracy and Laura. And uh, I ask uh, Nancy and Daniel to come back up to the podium, meaning turn on the camera. And uh, I, I noted a couple of questions, but I see that Ed Summers already posted one of them. And this um, dovetailed to what you just said, Tracy, on the expandability. I think you both mentioned in the talk that the PII properties are removed after the record are links. And so the question of growth is there. And this, is also a question that then afterwards I would like to hand over to you, Daniel. How is that happening at ODC? How do you link the data from the various sources? Not all of the surveys probably have the proper information to do that linkage. So both of you, if you could uh, share how you do that. I, I could jump right in quickly and say, no, the, um, uh, the Identifiers are still associated with those records. They're just behind a firewall that only like two people can see. Um, so if there are additional data that in fact, a, an external researcher may want to bring in some of their own data. For example, if there was a program that they knew ran a specific year in high school and they wanted to compare those who were in the program versus those who were not, they could bring the SSNs and that program information with them and have them linked. Great. How is that done in the Netherlands, Daniel? And how many people are doing this? I mean, Laura, you gave us a little bit of a sense of the size of your team, but uh, this can be a lot of work, I would suspect. And it doesn't look like people are paying separately for the linkage efforts. So, Daniel, how, how are you guys doing that? Well, I, I severely simplified the way that Odyssey is set up. And so the answer is, is incredibly complex, but um, if you're asking how um, surveys are, are, are currently already to, stati to Statistics Netherlands microdata, um, then, then that's done um, routinely uh, under, with, a, a, let's say, hundreds uh, of projects every year, maybe around a thousand or so. Um, and um, an example is in uh, the list panel, which uh, uh, some some people may know. Uh, the, well, there there is a personal identifier for each person, um, and and all the data is sent to Statistics Netherlands, and they uh, do the linkage. And basically, they have entire teams which are dedicated to doing these kinds of things. And there is a lot of experience with that kind of thing already for many years in the Netherlands because we've been doing uh, register-based, uh, fully register-based census. Uh, since the 70s. In fact, there's only one country that went before us, and that is Denmark again. So, uh, <laughs> uh, 
uh, there is a lot of yeah that there there's a huge infrastructure behind that. It's not that that there that that I am doing that personally or that every researcher has to do that by themselves, but it also brings costs with it, of course. It, exactly, and uh, and uh, so I guess this goes to all three of you. I I would like to ask. Uh, on both sides of that coin, you know, having either be at the center of planning this for the entire US or in the midst of doing it for the state of Maryland or in your case for the Netherlands. Is that about the state size of the state of Maryland? We have to check on that. Um, <laughs> I, the, um, what, what, what needs to be in place for it to work? You know, I mean, data centers have been built, you know, many times or attempts like this have been done many times. What are the key ingredients for it to work? And when does it not work? You know, I mean, what's the risk if someone were to undertake this or, you know, country or state gearing up to do it? Um, what What's sort of a guarantee for failure? Can you speak to that? Maybe Nancy, start. Sure. Um in, in our paper, we identified several things that we thought were ingredients for success. Um, and, you know, governance is a really important piece of this that I think is overlooked. Um, and especially in the US with a very decentralized system and, and um, not a clear path already forged in terms of um, deciding critical issues and in, in, um, having a lot of input from, from the public and from data users. So I think uh, governance and oversight and how that is structured is really key to getting people to support this idea because without that and without assurances, let's say to the privacy community, um, but without restricting access too much, I think it's very difficult to get this off the ground. Um, but once you can um, co-opt people to this idea and they start to trust it um, and can you can demonstrate benefit by understanding outcomes to various uh, programs and interventions in people's lives, um, and they can really start to understand the value of the data, it gets down to the nitty gritty of um, you know how, what is your, I mean, I hate to put it in these terms, but what does your business process look like? Is it really hard to get your um, applications to get access to the data approved? You know, when you think about how academia is structured with people's grants, for example, the money that they have from foundations, you need to have a process that's aligned with that. Not that people go get a grant and then you approve their project three years later. You know, so aligning the business process in the governance structure are just kind of basics that you need to do. But then there's the whole, um, you know, technology piece in terms of having good data linkage, the deciding what are the services that you're going to offer? What are the highest priority things that you have to put in place first? Um, that people most want when they're looking to link micro data and do this work. And so prioritizing the ability to deliver that. And I think there's a whole set of things that go with setup. And then there's another whole set of things that go with operations and ongoing, how do you keep improving and continuous learning and um, making sure you have a pipeline of people who actually can both do this work both outside the center, but also provide the services inside the center that are going to keep up with what the demands are. Yeah, thank you. I hear two keywords here, scaling and sustainability, um, uh, sort of in both directions. And I painfully <laughs> ran <laughs> up into troubles with both. Tracy, from your experience as the current director, um, anything you uh, want to add to sort of things that, that make it work or break it? Um, sure. So just to clarify, I'm not the current director, oh. um, but I'm the associate director. And um, right. actually, the uh, director for research for the center is is on the um, is is attending today. So I just want to clarify. That. You'll be the next um, director. That's the sustainability well, part. <laughs> so I think um, something that 
um, I'll echo is is this idea of, of governance um, and um, something that our our director um, has talked about is this idea of um, both both high quality uh, data as well as access. Um, so allowing people to you know having policies in, in place that allow people to get access to the data as opposed to only um, people that work for the center or affiliated with the University of Maryland um, to have access. And then also, um, I know for our center um, in particular, there's uh, you know there there are very detailed um, policies in place in terms of dissemination, right? So even if you have access to the data and you you might have a um, a research proposal that that has been approved, um, it that it's not that's not it you can't just take the data and do whatever you want with it um you know there's suppression review policies in place to make sure um you know what what you're going to be then sharing with the public has been reviewed for for privacy concerns um there's also you know this push to make sure the work that you're doing is actually going to reach the policy um policy to 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 have the to serve the goal that that um the, that you had, you know, the, the initial goal for the for the work, and to make sure that it, it's um, it's written in a way that that practitioners can access and read, as opposed to just for journals, for example. So there's, um, you know, there's a lot of of um, of detail, uh, not details, but but there's a lot of of steps that go into working with the center. Um, but I think it's in the end, what what you end up with is a, is a product that actually can inform um, inform policy. Tracy, I'm so glad that you mentioned something that Julia Lane always points out when she talks about the Coleridge Initiative, the importance that this is worthwhile for those that provide the data and understandable outside the academic publication literature. I think this is, I'm glad to hear that that's part of sort of mission and goal around your center too. I, I think that's great. Um, Daniel, turn this over to you for the same question, but also with an eye on the many questions that are filling up the chat. Uh, maybe you can speak a little bit to the role of open standards and open source software in designing this. So, you know, policies and software uh, sharing there, because I know that this is dear to your heart. And Peter Steiner asked, um, and I think this is also related to the policies on on sort of the, the um, how this is organized and having all the metadata that is necessary uh, to analyze the data successfully, right? There's, we all know that there's a lot of details one needs to know how was the imputation done, how is reliability and measurement, da, 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 da. So how, how do you organize that? Yeah, yeah, thanks for, for, for adding that because actually um, I think two of the main ingredients of Odyssey are that it's, um, and that's tying in with the previous discussion, basically a governance structure um, on, on data that are already being collected. Um, and the second thing is this uh, question of Peter's that um, uh, making all the metadata available, making everything. So it's, it's all about the process, the sustainability and making everything discoverable and um, um, interoperable. So that also means open standards um, and uh, machine readable uh, metadata. Um, and so th that's actually a big part of, of Odyssey that I, I didn't talk about at all, but there's uh, an entire team um, collaborating between the Free University uh, at the, uh, in Amsterdam and um, uh, the Netherlands eScience Center and other parties to uh, discover metadata, uh, put them in, in open standards and um, make that a, a key core part of the Odyssey um, portal, as it's called. So if you look up on the website that I showed you, Odyssey portal, uh, Peter, then you'll find a lot of information about exactly uh, this question, because it's one of the most important um, uh, keys to success. Um, and another key to success is, is, is that it, it's, it's not only an academically led uh, thing. Uh, so that's again, the Julia uh, Lane uh, uh, thing. It's, it's also very much initiated by the uh, statistical agencies um, because they have a legal mandate to um, make their data available for scientific research, but not much uh, resource to do so. So um, in, in a sense, it's also helping them to fulfill the, their legal mandate. But I, I would, uh, if I'm sorry, um, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt, but I, I was just triggered by uh, also the first thing that, that, that Stas is writing 
um, and, and something that you said earlier, East Netherlands is in terms of population only three Maryland's. So it's, it's less than half of California. And so uh, if you look at the level of the European Union, our mess is a, is a lot bigger yeah, than, than uh, the, the United States. For example, in the European Social Survey, we have had a project of, of more than five years only to, to um, harmonize the education variable. Just that, right? And, and famously, uh, France, uh, the French law forbids the collection of uh, ethnicity data. So, so that's, you know, the, 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 on that level, the, the challenges are, are very uh, big still. I want to use the last two minutes uh, to turn to some of the other uh, questions, lumping uh, Star's second questions and Romelia's questions sort of into one, which is related to the privacy. You mentioned that before, it's important to pay attention to that. Um, the, the, we, at least most of us here, or many of us here on the panel are aware of the discussion in the US. Um, the question to you, Danielle, is there a similar discussion going on uh, in the Netherlands, but also how to deal with legislation like the right to be forgotten, does that apply? Um, how has, does one need to think about that when these centers are built? Is this an additional extra burden um, paid on the institutions yes. that handle this data? Yes, so the right to be forgotten is um, a right that you find in uh, New Californian law and also the uh, the shield uh, the shield law in, in New York, and then some other um, new uh, bills around the world, and they're mostly inspired by uh, the GDPR. So of course we are also subject to the GDPR, um, but not completely because Statistics Netherlands has its own law, which which uh, uh, goes above the GDPR in a way, except for so so for Statistics Netherlands for statistical purposes. In a way, there is no right to be forgotten, obviously, but uh, for research purposes, there is right. So, uh, so of course, we are we are as researchers, we are simply subject to uh, to European privacy law. Um, and the way that the discussion and in, 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 to answer Stas's question is uh, going is not very focused on differential privacy at the moment, but uh, uh, very much on uh, data governance and. Um, layers of access and uh, that type of thing. So, so much more on the, the Coleridge uh, end of the spectrum than the uh, differential Great. privacy one. We're right on time. And, uh, you know, being a German host, I do need to hold us accountable to that. But I want to encourage uh, all of you speakers to ans type the answers into the Q&A in more detail and those that ask the questions to hang on a little bit. If you have other questions, post them now. I hope um, that that as we all start our next meeting, we can still sort of monitor what's going on here. Uh, and I do want to um, thank all of you, Nancy, Danielle, Tracy, and Laura for coming and uh, adding to this lively discussion. I hope it's inspiring for those who want to build infrastructure or at the very least use the ones that you guys are in the process of building. So thank you very much. Um, big round of applause from me here uh, <laughs> for all of us. And so um, thank you for coming and thank us all for attending. <laughs>